All right, folks, so hopefully you can see this in the, the bucket there. Everything's good. We're going to do our first test here, which is going to be negative to the lead, positive to the stainless. We are set on DC voltage. Hopefully you can see that meter. In it. And that is showing us 0.554 of a volt, so just about a half a volt. Let me go ahead and set the meter for the amperage on that. All right, so this is the milliamp test now. So once again, we're going to start with the lead to the, the stainless, 2.7 milliamps. We're going to go stainless to aluminum. Almost unmeasurable. I mean, it's just 0.08 of a milliamp. That's, so that's a useless combination. Let's go to the stainless to the brass. That's 0.6 of a milliamp. Let's go stainless to copper. And that actually has a pretty high reading right there. I don't know if I can keep them connected. That's got one point something of a milliamp. Uh, so that's a pretty good reading for milliampers between those two. Let's go to the aluminum. Let's go to the copper. Very low milliampers reading. Let's go, uh, let's go uh, brass to copper. Almost zero, and, I, and I'm running backwards here. Both very dense conductors in neither one of them. Yeah, look at that. Almost no amperage whatsoever off of that. All right, so we'll go copper to lead very quick. And the copper to lead has got very little amperage. So once again, the highest milliampers is stainless to lead. If I can get a good connection right there. With 2.7 milliamps. And the next closest is our brass to the stainless with one or under one milliamp. So there we go. It's actually just dropped down quite a bit. It's working about a half a milliamp. So there you go, folks. That was our combination of dissimilar conductors in use as a ground battery. I'll have a, another project that this is part of that I'll incorporate this into later. I just wanted to show you what a ground battery really is. Uh, like I said earlier, it's just literally some dirt with some water in there as the conductive medium between the rods. Here. I want to just go through the feasibility of, of what we could possibly use systems like this for. Right now in America, and for the last few years, we have been suffering from floods. And one of the things about floods is that it absolutely doesn't agree with AC voltage. Water and AC, bad friends. Uh, so, But DC and water get along just fine. And in fact, if what you're looking at here is basically a small-scale representation of a flooded town. If I had little buildings in there, let's say these are the flood waters from a river, and I have a pre-set up ground battery bank throughout my town to, let's say, keep a com uh, telecommunications network open, or, or back up DC power to people's houses for very low amperage use for a breathing machine if you've got sleep apnea, an oxygen machine if you need oxygen, or other medical needs. Now, these that flood waters come in, now that system is inactive most of the time or can be used whenever a, a rain is there to charge low voltage uh, backup systems. But that flood comes in, man, that system turns on automatically. DC low voltage LED lighting throughout the town could turn on. I mean, that would be a, a huge help for our communities during these disasters, let alone the communications lines being kept open like the old telegraph systems were. This was how they powered our telegraph systems in the United States, was banks of ground batteries. Uh, so this is just something I'm looking at. How big would it really need to be? What metals work the best? What's my amperage and voltage readings? And how big would it need to be to power a town's needs? Not We're not talking for duration or, or main lighting. We're talking backup emergency needs. Uh, so I'll, as we get this going and as I see the final results from this project, we're going to try to see, on paper at least, I'll give you a representation of just how big it would have to be for an average size, let's say, uh, 50,000 person community. Uh, right now you can see we've definitely jumped over now uh, the 9 milliamp range and we are still on the uptick. So we are definitely going to see 10 milliamps at that half a volt range. Uh, so this is pretty exciting. I know that doesn't seem like much power, but when you actually consider what I've got here and how little that really is, and how simple, a few rods of metal. Now we can exclude this. Uh, that's just providing high, higher amperage the lead is. We can actually use the stainless and the brass, and we'll have a little lower amperage, but the voltage is higher, and, and the, the effect to our environment obviously would be much lower. Uh, Alright folks, we're at the end of the night here. I'm losing light quick, so I'm going to do this fast. Uh, what we've been able to get up to here is 10.21 milliamps. And at that range, to get up to 1 amp will take us 100 couples of these uh, dissimilar conductors. 
uh, to get that one amp up to 24 volts, or up to 12 volts, I'm sorry, we'll take 24 couples uh, times that 100 couple. So we're looking at 2400 uh, coupled together ground battery rods to achieve one amp at 12 volts. Now let's say we needed 10 amps. That is 24,000 couples uh, of these dissimilar conductors to produce 10 amps uh, at 12 volts. Now it sounds like an awful lot, but if you think about what we can actually achieve in diameter, these don't need to be very big around. Uh, so 2400 at one. One amp's not a lot of power, but let's say you are getting one amp at 24 hours a day. You're talking about about 288 watts throughout a 24 hour period for 2400 of these couples. Uh, that's not a lot of power, but over uh, a time frame, or let's say you run off grid, you know that 288 watts is actually a very usable amount of wattage. A uh, small scale flat screen TV probably takes 30 watts, 40 watts. So you can watch that TV for quite a few hours uh, based on the charge that you could build off of just a, a small scale ground battery system uh, over a 24 hour period's worth of buildup. Now if you were up to the 24,000 couple marker here with 10 amps an hour, you're talking about 2,880 uh, watts every day that that would produce. I mean, that, that's a lot of power off-grid, really. You could, you could actually run a small, uh, super-efficient refrigeration system from your ground battery bank alone. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Tessalonian in the Tessalonian Man Show. Hi, folks. Mr. Tessalonian back here again. I kind of want to do just a quick update on our ground battery stuff. Uh, what I've done here is this rod that you see right here is a new rod in there, and what it is is one of these. These are carbon rods. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and just test carbon out also. I have quite a few of these carbon rods, so I've thrown one in there. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick voltage reading from the carbon rod to our stainless, from the carbon to our lead, and our, uh, our brass here. So let me go ahead and give you a reading. So we're going to go first of all from our stainless to our carbon. So our voltage between carbon and stainless is 0.947 of a volt. So almost an entire volt right there. Let me turn the meter over to amperage. Okay, so now we're set on DC milliamperage. And let's go ahead and give that a reading again between our stainless and our... Right there, I keep saying it's my connection. That's no good here, folks. Get a better connection. Maybe it'll stay steadier. All right, so let's look at almost a volt at 10 milliamps right there. Let's go ahead and take a quick milliamp reading from that carbon to our lead. And we're looking about 5 milliamps. Uh, let's go ahead and try the carbon to the uh, brass. Almost nothing there. Wow, that's terrible. Uh, let's try the carbon to the lead, or to the copper. Nothing. And one over here to the aluminum. Um, at least there's some kind of milliamperage here at the aluminum between that. Now let's go back to the stainless. Bam, 10 milliamps. So that's 10 milliamps at almost a full volt between our stainless and our carbon rod. Uh, let me go ahead and turn that back over to DC voltage real quick, and I'm going to show you the rest of the voltage between the carbon and the rest of those metals. All right, folks, so I have that meter now set at DC voltage. What we're going to do here is do a quick test between all these metals and that carbon rod. I've been moving all these around a little bit, pushing them down as I test. Anytime you move them in the dirt, the dirt loses a little bit of the contact around the outsides of these, and it actually will drop the voltage a little. But let's go ahead and take from carbon to our lead. We're looking about a half a volt. Let's go carbon to copper. Wow, that uh, doesn't look very promising. Uh, let's go carbon to brass. Once again, not at all promising. Let's go carbon to aluminum. Well, at least aluminum showed a third of a volt. And let's go carbon to stainless here. There we go. All right, so carbon to stainless is showing 0.903 of a volt, so almost a complete volt. So that was seems to be carbon and stainless seem to have the highest potential uh, for creating current out of any of these conductors that I've tried. Now, there's obviously things like zinc and other conductors that can still be tried in this, uh, but right now, out of easier to find conductor materials than zinc, zinc's not the easiest thing to find in large quantities, 
uh, copper, stainless, things like this are a lot easier. Now, the uh, carbon isn't going to be quite as easy. Uh, carbon can be found inside of certain batteries and other things. Uh, but that is actually going to definitely be our best setup. Or you, you got to think, you know, stainless and some carbon rod, that's pretty neutral materials. Uh, I highly doubt there's a lot of pollution created from those two materials. All right, so real quickly here, I want to drop in a second uh, carbon rod into this whole mix. We're going to throw that carbon rod right there. Let's go ahead and push that down into that soil. All right, so we've got a second carbon rod. Now, I want to do a test here, and I don't know what this answer is going to be, but let's do a test between these two carbons. Oh, well, it does say half a volt. I do have it hooked up in reverse for some reason. Why would one carbon give a better result? Uh, so it does say half a volt. Now, let's see if changing the distance between... Wow, look at that, folks. Changing the distance between the stainless rod and the carbon rod improved our voltage pretty dramatically. Uh, if I'm not mistaken there, that's 1.389 of a volt. Uh, that's a pretty substantial increase compared to 0.9 of a volt this far away from our stainless steel rod. So by incorporating this carbon rod much closer to our stainless rod here, we've increased our voltage quite dramatically. Let's take a quick amperage test of that. All right, folks, so we have that set on DC milliamps, and we're going to go ahead and take another reading from this and see how much different our milliamp reading is. Holy cow, look at that. Uh, okay, so let me go ahead now and uh, do the math on what that milliamp reading with the voltage we just saw is going to give us for uh, wattage at a certain amount of these couples together. All right, folks, so here's the end of the ground battery video just to give you an idea of the numbers that we're looking at to combine up to both 1 amp and 10 amps uh, with the numbers that we just saw with the carbon in the stainless steel rod. First of all, it would take 8.7 combined couples of those two dissimilar uh, conductors to equal 12 volts at that uh, voltage range. Now, you're going to have to multiply that times 50 to get 1 amp. So that's going to equal altogether 435 combined couples of those two dissimilar conductors for 1 amp an hour. Now, now you multiply that times 10 and you're going to be up to 10 amps, which is 4,350. Combine couples of those two carbon and a stainless steel rods, uh, that'll actually give you that 10 amps an hour, 24 hours a day, until both of those rods have basically corroded down to uh, no longer usable, which will probably end up being the stainless uh, before the carbon. Until next time, hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Tesalonian in the Tesalonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Tesalonian back here again. I'm working on our earth batteries and right now what I've done is built a couple cells. Uh, these will actually be individual cells that all you have to do is leave them dry until you need them and add some water to them. Uh, what we have here is our smallest one of these. This doesn't work all that well. I was just testing it out to see how many times I can interlay uh, metals inside of each other. So we have a copper, a stainless, a stainless, and a copper. And each one of them's got an insulator between them and a little bit of dirt smash down in there keeping them all separated from each other you add a little water to this and it does produce uh, about a third of a volt which is not very good but it also you know for the size it's not too bad uh, what we have here is we have a brass rod uh, hollow brass tube here is the outside of the case and inside of that what I have is a, one of our carbon rods uh, that is actually just got some styrofoam to keep it from electrically connecting with the uh, outside edges of that cop or that brass what we're going to do here is activate both of these cells, this one and this one, by pouring some water in here over the top, letting it drain down. Inside of this, I have soil. Same soil we showed in the bucket as our uh, earth battery test. So I've just basically taken a uh, styrofoam ring that keeps this from touching the outside edge. Uh, put that down all the way at the bottom to keep it down here at the bottom. Filled the rest with dirt and put one more of those at the top. Uh, that way it's all just suspended away from the outer ring. We're going to add some water to that for in a minute. What we got here is a uh, our stainless rod, which I believe is really steel covered in zinc. I can't remember. It doesn't have the tag on it. I can't remember what blue meant. Uh, if somebody out there give me a, uh, if you remember what it is, give me an idea of what the blue was. Is that uh, zinc coated uh, steel or is that actually stainless? Uh, so anyways, what we have is the same thing. Basically, we have a piece of styrofoam in there. 
uh, once again all the way down at the bottom again holding this out from the uh, outer edges keeping it from coming in contact uh, one down here at the bottom then we filled the rest full of earth and one more little plug at the top here we've silicone the bottom of these all shut so they'll hold the moisture in them uh, which should do a pretty good job keeping our battery cell up and running so let me go ahead and set up the camera and we're gonna add some water to that hook the meter up and watch the voltage and amperage grow all right, folks, so this is the final test for the tonight of our individual cell earth batteries. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and test our first cell here for final voltage. We're at quite a high voltage, over half a volt. Let's check our second cell. We've almost got to the half a volt mark on our second cell, which is producing much higher amperage. So let's check out our amperage on this. Okay, so we're set on DC milliamps. Let's go through and test our first cell for milliamperage. Very similar to what we started with, but our half a volt with that 11 or so milliamps is not too bad for an earth battery made out of very simple materials. Wow, that spike at the beginning was in the 40 milliamp range. Well, alright, so that's not so bad. We've been able to show a pretty decent uh, milliamperage from both of those, a pretty decent voltage. Uh, this is very small cells. These are things that I'm just starting with. And there's obviously much better conductors to use for this. And also, an electrolyte could easily be added. I have a feeling that the acidic nature in the soil I'm using is actually probably producing a very heavy electrolyte in these, just due to the fact that of the voltage and the amperage I am seeing. So until next time, hope you enjoyed our Earth Battery Cell Program. Uh, this is Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show.